the you, questions. You, yeah. We introduce, okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Kirsten Gowen. I grew up in America. Um, I lived in America for 21 years and then I moved here. Okay, you're leaving now. Um, and I moved to, well, I moved to China first and I lived there for about a year, uh, mid COVID actually. Um, I, I was there when COVID hit. And then uh, I moved to Hong Kong and I've lived in Hong Kong for about four years now. So, I've lived abroad about five years, um, almost five years. And I left America originally because I learned Chinese when I was there. My stepmom is from Hong Kong, so she speaks Chinese. And I learned it through her and then high school and then college. I studied it as a minor and then a major. And so um, I wanted to go and live somewhere where they speak Chinese. Uh, so I moved to China. Didn't work out. <laughs> COVID hit. Kind of didn't really like the government or like how things were run there. So I left and I came to Hong Kong. Um, and now I stayed here because I really like teaching. I absolutely love teaching. I work in a school as a teacher. I teach primary one, primary two, and primary five. Uh, so a little bit of background on my thing. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening uh, to everyone. And welcome Ms. Kirsten to our forum discussion. And thank you so much for attending the forum for today. And our topic for today is wedding ceremony of various races and nationalities. But first of all, I would like to introduce to all of you about our speakers for this evening. We have Amira, Munira, Alia, Maisara, Kolila, Huda, Nico, Anis, Huda, and Rutra, and also me, Amila as your moderator for this evening. So I would like to start the discussion with our panel first. So my first question is, does your nation provide remittances to both sides or one side or nine? Um, so are you asking in terms of the government providing resources to both sides or is it the family? That you're looking for? Uh, the family one. Uh, okay, so um, our government won't provide any kind of resources. We do get tax benefits from marriage, however. Um, our families, it really depends on family tradition because America is a really big mixing pot, um, which is to say we have a lot of different cultures. So it very heavily depends on the culture that you're brought up in. Um, I was brought up specifically on the, on the East Coast. Uh, so in that kind of culture and, and in a white family um, or a Caucasian family, it was thought that really the family wouldn't would help pay for the wedding, but it wouldn't be something where they would give you um, like copious amounts of money. They wouldn't give it to house. They wouldn't do anything like that unless they had the money. Some families do that. Uh, but because of the really big middle and lower class in America at the moment, a lot of families aren't going to be able to afford those big budget weddings and a lot of families won't afford big gifts. So it's normally small little things. And then the guests at the wedding, those um, whether it's family or friends or coworkers are expected to bring some small gift to give to the uh, husband and wife as a couple, not necessarily individually. Yeah. All right, thank you to Ms. Kirsten for the answer. Uh, what is your opinion, Amira Iwani? So, uh, in my opinion, for Malay culture, where the traditional Malay marriage is a very colorful and vibrant celebration that combines Malay culture with Islamic marriage rites and can often last for several days and has distinct ceremonies. So, we have like a gift and dowry where the groom offering a gift to the bride family in typical in Malay culture. So as a sign of the beginning of husband's commitment to his wife to uh, provide for her daily needs, such as gift, uh, where it presented by the groom to the bride are required. But however, marriage can go forward even without it. So once the proposal is accepted, so it will may take up to like uh, for a week and also when the engagement date is uh, determined. So uh, during Bertunang, which uh, that was Malay term we call for engagement ceremony. So we, we give uh, exchange between couple, like your culture, 
and then um where and also the engagement period may last between six months and three years. So that's all from me. Thank you. And right now I'm gonna pass to the next speaker, which is Kalila. Before I explain about the remittance issue of who provide it, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Nora Kalila Binti Mama Shufi with metric number. 0920-2309-373. Okay, for the question posted to the panel, the issue country provide remission to both parties or one party or neither, and submitted by our panel, Tristan for American Carter Emerit. With that, I, I will evaluate the issue from the point of view of the Indian in Malaysia in the merit custom here about Dory. In the past, Dory was requested by almost every family of the groom from the white family. The Dory that is requested will sometimes be in the white side, and this calling them will be unable to marry. No, stay. In the society, we, where Dory is no longer required not to burden the white family, they are more willing to cooperate and build the marriage together. This is for the teaching and this thing give respect to women because they are no longer considered a burden. In conclusion, the Indian community in Malaysia has various marriage customs that have been passed down from generation to generation. But due to, per, to, due to the pieces of time, they, they have been some changes, but they are for Indian community we will still try and try to maintain the traditional wedding custom to this day. The continuation of the marriage custom of the nation in the community need to be maintained through so that, so that they do not lose their identity and self-identity. That's all from me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kalila, for the answer. Now we move on to the next question. So the question is, how have modern influences impacted the traditional clothing worn by the brides and grooms? Do I stop first? Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, you can. Oh, I already stopped. Hmm? Oh, Sorry, it's a it's a bit laggy for me. So, uh, so it's uh, I, I can't really hear clearly. Okay. Uh, uh, assalamualaikum and good evening to all panelists and our speaker. Thank you to Amira. So I will explain how have traditional influence the traditional clothing used by brides and groom. Okay, for the Indian culture, especially uh, bridal lehengas. If you are not really sure, Sure. Uh, bridal hangers, it's like a crop top and a skirt. While for the sari, uh, people always confuse these two, uh, lehengas and sari. Lehengas uh, always been used in marriage ceremony, while sari are uh, being used mostly in Indian country. Okay, so uh, bridal lehengas, uh, it's like crop top and a skirt while for sari there's like a piece of clothing from waist until from waist until their shoulder they always put it there so that is called sari that is the difference between lehengas and sari okay so the how does modern influence for indian culture uh the bridal lehengas there is uh, even though there is still uh remains of traditional uh modern influence have lead to the incorporation of content Contemporary elements. Contemporary elements uh, includes experimental cuts and conventional color combination and the use of non-traditional fabrics. Okay, for the uh, color palettes, for the unconventional color combinations, uh, traditional colors like red, uh, gold are still being used as they are symbolizing uh, auspiciousness and prosperity. However, modern influences have introduced a wider range of colors for both brides and grooms, which is pastels 
and uh, gradients or maybe uh, tones, which is becoming more common. Like it's, it's not a dual looking like lyric and gold. There's, there's, uh, there's a unique kind of uh, looking right now for the brights and grooms. Okay. For the fabric choice, uh, since uh, modern textile technologies have expanded the range of fabrics available for wedding attire, brides and grooms now have more options in terms of materials because we used to uh, use only silk, silk, S-I-L-K, for the traditional attire. Just for that, since we have uh, been, uh, we have expanded the range of fabrics uh, due to modern technologies, uh, there are wider fabric options such as uh, uh, such as uh, chiffons and georgette. These materials are preferred for their comfort and ease of movement, especially for destinations or weather, especially in Malaysia, we are quite hot, right? So this kind of uh, fabrics make it easier for the brides and grooms to attend weddings or events with a more relaxed atmosphere and attire. Okay, next is uh, accessories, embroidery. Okay, uh, for the brides, uh, they usually go for the minimalist, which is uh, just a, a few bits of uh, accessories, but uh, they, are, they are starting to use for modern influence, which is crystals and 3d floral while the grooms the grooms are also experimenting with accessories like brushes and unique turban ornaments okay for the customization and personalizations with the rise of bespoke and designer wear couples now have the opportunity to work closely with designer to create outfits that reflect their individual tastes and preference so that this allow for more personal touch, incorporating modern elements that resonate with the couples and creativity in wedding attire. Okay, I think that's all from me. I will pass this question to our panels. Okay, I just I'll continue. Uh, it allowed me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Maisara Binti Shaifuddin. Uh, Give my opinion about uh for wedding wedding dress for for Malay Malay culture for for Malay culture uh usually for fabric and materials uh we usually use a uh, traditional clothes uh you know some uh we our Malaysian style is uh we wear uh baju kurung for bride and for the Groom, uh, we used to call it uh, baju melayu. Uh, so for for time to time, I guess uh, the influence, uh, I mean, uh, for the tradition, wait wait. Uh, for the fabric, um, Malay culture use is popular uh, among uh, uh, groom uh, clothes, so. Uh, I can see everyone uh, face. Uh, so, uh, however, modern influence have introduced uh, a wider range of fabric clothes. So, I guess uh, for back time, uh, we back time in an old generation, I guess it's kind of hard to find a really good uh, material clothes. But right now, um, Right now, it's kind of easy to find a good quality, uh, such quality clothes so for affordable option. So, um, I guess, uh, when affordable, uh, yeah, the the material is kind of you know, uh, since Malaysia is hot, so uh, the the suitable of the Fabric and materials is a uh, suit for Malaysia weather. So next to design and style, uh, 
modern fashion trends have influenced the design and style of traditional wedding attire. Um, usually, uh, what it makes usually what it it's mean is uh, next for the next point is design and style. Uh, for Malaysian culture is, uh, modern fashion trend have influenced the design and style of traditional wedding attire. Uh, while the basic elements of traditional Malay wedding attire remain intact, and the designer often incorporate to contemporary elements such as modern silhouette, embroidery uh, techniques, uh, color combination, and to create a fusion traditional and modern aesthetic. In multicultural Malaysia, uh, uh, it's not uncommon for couples from different ethnic backgrounds to incorporate, uh, incorporate elements from each other's tradition into their wedding attire. This fusion of culture can result in unique and modern interpretation of traditional wedding attire. So for next uh, point is uh, tradi traditional Malay wedding uh, color choice is uh, back back uh, back then uh, usually more usually uh, Malay people uh, they don't they don't use uh, bright color they usually go for white gold and just a plain plain design uh, plain design or traditional Malay design but but for for the modern times or so they so the colors are more to bright bright colors uh, and aesthetic colors such as uh, uh, pastel color uh, bright bright color and i guess uh, it is depends on a uh, family uh, opinion uh, which one they want to use uh, their color themes for their wedding so for the lastly, uh, my point is accessory. Accessory uh, uh, play a crucial, crucial role in traditional wedding attire. Um, modern influence have seen the introduction of new accessories and the incorporation of modern jewelry design to complement traditional outfits. Uh, such uh, usually uh, for accessories, uh, bright, uh, they have the uh, necklace earrings and also a uh, hair piece a uh, hair piece at the head uh, but in but they still use using a traditional uh, design so i guess uh, that's all for me thank you Okay, so um, in American culture, so I suppose it's more like a Western culture because America got a lot of its influence from particularly Europe, uh, as we were originally Europeans before we took over our country in horrendous ways. Uh, sorry. So for us, I think it's actually quite similar to what you're noticing in your own cultures. Um, as you said, like the color and the style and the accessories have definitely changed a lot. Um, but whereas uh, we had gone from you know, we actually originally had very colorful dresses uh, way back before the 1840s, I do believe. Uh, Queen Victoria wore a white dress uh, to her wedding. And so a lot of women at that time took that as the big fashion statement of the era. And they intended to model their weddings after hers because Queen Victoria had a very successful marriage with lots of children. And that was seen as something that was really, you know, looked up to and wanted during that era and as a result a lot of women moved away from the kind of the traditional very beautiful very colorful and flowery dresses that we used to see which were pinks and uh, blues and all kinds of colors even black was used by women um, prior to that so they moved away from that and into the white dress but that was quite a while ago I wouldn't call that um, necessarily modern however that modern that tradition has continued all the way through the modern era where women are still keeping to that white dress. However, nowadays, we do see a little bit of a swing back towards the more color, colorful palettes, because we do have, you know, a more globalized world. And with all the different cultures in America, and also not just in America, but, you know, the internet and the ability to see um, 
the ability to see uh, everybody else's culture and how they are handling their weddings and the gorgeous dresses that you some of you guys have. Um, a lot of Western women are looking at that and thinking, that's pretty. I would like to have that rather than this white dress that's kind of plain um, with sequins and things. Uh, so we are seeing a swing back with kind of some purples and blues being accented in there with ribbons. Um, but it's not normally the full dress change uh, that it used to have. And then there's a move as well towards, I would say, in a way, skimpier outfits is, is a kinder word for it, where there's showing a lot more skin. It used to cover up a lot more. Um, so the cut is definitely changing. And women are, instead of having one dress, they'll have two dresses, one for the ceremony where, you know, you say I do, and then one for the party after where they can dance in it because their ceremony dress is either too big or too poofy or the, tr the um, trail is too long. You know, the end of the dress that trails behind her is too long. Um, and then, of course, for accessories, which I believe is the next topic, is uh, we're seeing a big move away from the veil. I'm not sure about other cultures. I do know in China, they have the veil that goes over the woman's face and we, we lift it with the red. We did that as well in Western culture um, where we actually had a slightly thinner, like it's more see-through veil and it was normally white to match the dress. And what that originally was for was actually because a lot of times women didn't want to get married um, or women who didn't want to get married were beaten before the wedding and it was to cover up any marks on her. Um, so that they wouldn't seem ugly or it was even to hide what the woman looks like so the man couldn't run away and deny the wedding um, as it was already happening. Uh, nowadays, it just became this like a little fancy tradition where you lift the veil, it's supposed to be this beautiful thing. Um, but we're seeing a move away from that as well, but I don't believe that's necessarily because of any um, influence in terms of culture. I think it's more of a socioeconomic influence where we're seeing this economy of, we don't have enough money for these fancy things. We barely have enough money for the wedding and the dress. So getting those accessories, those excess, um, the veil, the fancy hairpins, the crowns, the tiaras, the earrings, the necklaces, um, unless they're passed down from the mother to the daughter or grandmother to daughter, we're not really seeing them as heavily anymore due to just money. Um, and I would like to pass it back to the panel. That's about all I know. <laughs> all right. Thank you, speakers Aliar and speakers Marisara and our beloved panel for the answer. So now we move on to the next question. So the question is, what is the initial stage of the marriage process? Good evening to all the speakers and to our panelists. I am Anisha Pita, Binti Muhammad Zaini. So based on our topic today, marriage ceremony of various ethnic and nation. And the question is, what is the initial stage of marriage process? Okay. Uh, I'm going to e explain about Indian wedding. Traditionally, the process began with family of the groom or process of kundali. In the other words, is horoscope matching, which is to analyze the birth charts of to ensure similarity between the couple. Then the groom family will decide whether the woman is suitable for his their son life partner or not. The time to visit the woman's house is also kept as a secret from the groom. In Indian culture, the concept of proposal has few steps and factors. Uh, I'm sorry, Speaker Anis, uh, we couldn't hear you. Sorry. After getting approval from both sides, the groom family will come at the bride house in an odd number carrying many goods such as coconut, beetle nuts and others. The groom to be will will say the vow direct to declare his willingness to marry the bride and the, 
the marriage will be officially announced. Uh, as a symbol of their relationship, the two partners are going to exchange the battle nuts. The couple will do Nichayam ritual, which is generally the exchanging of flowering after discussing the wedding day and shopping for decoration, inv invitation card, and so on. Thank you. I will pass the... I will pass to the next speaker, Huda, to explain about Malay ethnic. Good evening to all speakers and to our panelists. Uh, for me, I will share some insights about the first stage of marriage among the Malay ethnic group. Uh, so, in Malay culture, the first stage of marriage is called Marisik. It is when guys family visits, the girls family visits if they are a good match. Uh, the primary purpose of marriage is to introduce the families and assess whether the woman is interested in the proposal. During this uh, phase, a family representative, which we call it uh, as Wakil, plays a crucial role in assessing the girl's background and initiating discussion with the girl's family um, about their intention. Uh, if there is a uh, positive response, then it may lead to further investigations. Uh, and then the next stage uh, is known as Burgana, which we call it as uh, engagement in English. So uh, for uh, once many said has been uh, successful and there is a positive connection between two families, the men's family will face uh, another visit. Uh, during this visit, the guy's family uh, will uh, visit again to uh, discuss uh, when the engagement will happen, what gifts and money they will give uh, to help with the wedding expenses and uh, also for the wedding day. Uh, the engagement uh, is also where both families sit down and sorry, the engagement is also where both families sit down and plan the wedding and also talk about the wedding engagement or the consequences if one decides uh, want to cancel the engagement. Uh, I think that's all for me. And then I will pass uh, to the panel for explain about her culture. Thank you. All right, thank you, Speaker Anis and Speaker Huda. Uh, what about you, Miss Kristen? Do you have any opinion? I mean, sorry. Um, so in when Western culture, the initial stages of a marriage process is very different again depending on the family every family uh, when it comes down to this it comes down to family tradition rather than the cultural tradition um however one of the overarching ideas is that you have of course the engagement where the man or the woman um, proposes to their partner and uh, normally it's you know cemented with a ring we have the diamond rings is very traditional um, nowadays, because there was a very huge push um, in terms of big companies wanting women to think that diamonds are really big. Uh, that happened in uh, the 19th, 19th century, um, early, late, mid 19th century, I believe, like 1970s or 50s. Um, it started happening where there was a big push for diamonds. So again, that kind of became big uh, for us. And afterwards after you have the engagement of course there's an announcement and you have an engagement party um to celebrate that engagement normally with close friends and family however <laughs> however there have been people who've done bigger engage engagement parties um and the ones that you hear about tend to be very big in the news but most most are very small um after the engagement party you have of course you know a gap between when you're engaged and when you actually get married and that could be super super short um it could also be extremely long and it all depends on the couple and their decision making and it also really depends on their economic status um because if the family helps them with the wedding then of course they'll have it a lot earlier um since they have the money but if they don't have help with that uh weddings tend to be extremely expensive um upwards of a hundred thousand uh, dollars us dollars uh so if <laughs> It's a lot of money and a lot of people don't have that kind of money. A wedding dress alone can range from even like, you know, really cheap ones, $100, but can be 10 k um, So it's, again, it's really expensive. Uh, so you, of course, have that stage where you don't really 
have a chance um, to get married just for financial reasons. Uh, but prior to the marriage, we also have a bachelorette and bachelor party. And those are hosted by our maid of honor and man of honor, uh, a best man. So during the wedding, you have the maid of honor that stands at the bride's side. You also have the uh, best man who stands at the groom's side. And those people will um, create parties where it's kind of like your last you know, chance at freedom, so to speak. So you do crazy things during your bachelor and bachelorette party. There are normally um, people who are, you know, certain types of dancers who are very scandally, scad, you know, scandally dressed or um, barely dressed at all. Uh, there's alcohol, there is sexual games, there are all kinds of things. There are some weddings that are even, you know, completely ruined by these uh, kinds of parties when people get too wild. So we have the bachelor and bachelorette party, and then of course you go into the marriage after that. Um, but we don't really have any, I would say, more cultural, culturally rooted things that are based in religion and based in um, based in like a, a grounded culture from America. It's more just kind of like parties, essentially. So uh, I would like to pass the time back to the speakers or the panel. All right, thank you so much for the answer. Um, so now we move on to the last question. And the question is, um, are there any rituals or customs that take place after the wedding ceremonies? And for this lot, I'm opening the question to any of our speakers and panels. So. Uh, if you guys wouldn't mind, I'd, I can start this one. Um, so for rituals and customs, I wouldn't call them rituals. I would more call them customs uh, because again, in terms of economy, we don't have a lot of money anymore. Um, to take place after the wedding so um our wedding is in kind of like kind of explains. it happens in stages um so what we consider the actual wedding itself is the ceremony um where the bride and the groom will be you know wed by a priest or wh whoever they are religiously following um a you know higher member of the community that has been allowed to say yeah like these two people are married um so that's our ceremony. The bride walks down the aisle, all that fun stuff, right? Uh, after that, we have a party. And it's called the reception, where um, the bride will change into her dancing clothes. And after they say, I do, the bride and the groom, sorry, my cat is playing with a bag. Um, the bride and the groom <laughs> will um, have their first dance. But pr um, even prior to that, the it's traditional that the bride will dance with her father. Uh, one last time. And it's, this is more of a grounded tradition, I would say, because it's seen as a way of the father's final, like, goodbye to his daughter. Um, it's very emotional. There's lots of videos and pictures being taken at this point. It's a very special occasion where nobody else is allowed to dance at that time. And then after that, the groom will come in and ask for the bride's hand away from the dad, and then they will have their first dance. And after about a few minutes, the rest of the party starts to dance along with them, normally as couples. And then after that, it's, you know, it devolves into alcohol and food and just fun. Um, and it will go all night. There is also after, again, after the ceremony, um, during that time, after the dancing, the bride has a, uh, traditionally she'll have a bouquet of flowers. And what she'll do after the party or during the party even is she'll take that bouquet and she'll throw it behind herself. And to, and it's all of the maids of honor and other women at the dance, um, single women specifically or um, dating women who will stand behind her. And whoever catches that bouquet of flowers is supposed to be the next one who gets married. Um, it's supposed to show good luck in their relationship. And it's a passing of the baton in a sense. Um, and then, of course, you have that as well as the um some some parties will do this where you cut the cake um together the couple will cut the cake um and sometimes it's just served it really depends on the couple in that, that case and then even after that you have the wedding night and i'm sure you all of them most most cultures have the wedding night um <laughs> Now, I think modern day wedding nights are a little bit different because there's no like, I, I think for the most part, there's no big expectation for men and women, at least in the Western culture, to have, you know, their night of passion. Um, because a lot of times in Western culture, those are things that have already happened prior. 
um, unless you are, of course, heavily Christian or heavily, heavily religious. But even then, the wedding is such a big event and it's such a long day um, that a lot of times, from what I've heard, at least, you become so exhausted that you don't even have your wedding night. So whereas before, traditionally, this was something that was heavily pushed, you must do this. Um, nowadays, it's less so. Um, yeah, I would like to pass it back to the panel. All right, thank you for the answer, Ms. Kirsten. And what about you, Nico? Do you have any opinion? Okay, so I am going to share the Muslim post-wedding rituals. Uh, the first one is Rushat, and it means the goodbyes. After the traditional Muslim wedding has been brought to an end by the R.C. Mushraf, the first post-wedding rituals begin. This is known as Rushat. Here, the bride is given the opportunity to bid her family goodbye. After the wishes and farewells, the father of the bride hands her over to the groom and asks him to take good care of his daughter. Mm -hmm. The bride then leaves the wedding venue with her groom and heads to his house. On her arrival at her new home, she is welcomed by her mother-in-law, who then places the Holy Quran on her head to symbolize her duties as a wife. As for the second post-wedding ritual is the Walima, also known as mm -hmm. Dawat i Dalima, the grand celebration. It is a lavish wedding banquet that is usually hosted by the groom's family. Immediate and distant relatives, friends, and even neighbors are invited to the feast. It is a grand wedding reception that is organized for the newlyweds to wish them a happy married life. The, this reception allows the couple to unwind a bit and also be introduced to extended family members and friends. The couple is treated like royalty and they are showered with more gifts and blessing. Walima is the final public declaration of the marriage in the presence of loved ones and the whole community. And as for the last post-wedding ritual, it's called Chauti. This happens four days after the wedding. The bride and groom set out to visit the bride's family. On their arrival, they are greeted by the bride's family with lots of gifts and love. After the greetings and pleasantries, the family moves to the dining room for a hearty meal. The meal marks the end of the long but exciting wedding ceremony and rituals between the two families. The bride and groom are once again showered with gifts and prayers before they leave. And that's all from me. Okay, thank you, Speaker Nicole. And uh, what about you, Speaker, uh, Speaker Rutra? Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Rutra Devi Chandran. Uh, yes, there is uh, rituals and customs that take place after the wedding ceremony in Indian culture. Okay. One of the common uh, ceremony uh, that followed by all the Indian, uh, Indians are uh, Graha Pravish ceremony. Okay, the ceremony is a traditional ceremony uh, which the brides and entry into uh, her new home after her wedding. The ceremony is performed on the first day of the bride and groom arrive at their new home together. And uh, it, is, it is a joyous occasion that symbolize the bride's new beginning as a wife and uh, a new member in her husband's family. And also the ceremony typically begins with the bride and grooms uh, being welcomed at the doorstep of their new home by their mother-in-law. Mother-in-law then perform, performs uh, some arti, which is mean uh, a, a Hindu ritual uh, that involves waving a little flame okay, in a plate so, uh, before the bride and groom enter the new home. And also, uh, the, uh, after that, the bride and groom will bring to the prayer room and also uh, perform some, some prayers with their family members and also to seek blessing from our gods. Uh, after, the, after the prayers, uh, the bride and groom will be served with some 
traditional Indian sweets, uh, such as all uh, two like that, uh, as a symbol of sweetness and prosperity. Uh, in some regions of India, there are additional rituals uh, that are performed during Graha Pravesh ceremony. For example, uh, in some communities, the bride is asked to kick a pot of uh, small rice at the entrance of the house, of their new house. And this belief, uh, belief that uh, it will bring a good luck and prosperity to the new couple. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Speaker Rutra, for the answer. So now we move on to the free session question and answer. So hi, Kirsten. Uh, my name is Mira. I'm going to ask you a few questions. So if you were given a choices, would you like to marry someone of the, of the same race as you or another race? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, that's <laughs> so I live abroad right now. Uh, so considering the fact that I do live abroad, it's it's highly likely that I would marry someone um, of a different race than me. And I see absolutely no problem with it. I don't have a preference uh, actually at all. And the, the only problem would be that um, personally, I don't see myself getting married <laughs> um, just for like personal reasons. Um, but if I was to get married, I, I don't particularly care if it's the same race or a different race. If it was to be um, a different race, however, I think I would be more more willing and actually I, I would want to follow their traditional wedding um, or wedding traditions and uh, roots and culture than mine because I find maybe it's just that I grew up with it and I watched it, you know, in movies and read it in books and like I, I've been to weddings before um, for Western weddings. So perhaps that's it for me, but I don't particularly find Western weddings that interesting and I don't find the dresses very pretty and I don't particularly like a lot of the um, rather boring and my opinion cultural aspects of it uh I, I don't mind the dances or anything but it's very simply just like you walk down the aisle and you say i do and then you go and you have like a party i find that quite boring compared to a lot of other culturals uh, cultures and weddings so um i don't particularly mind whatever race i marry i don't care however if i was to marry someone of a different race than me i would follow their traditional weddings i hope that answers so thank you Oh, I see. Your life is pretty interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Munira and our panel for the question and answer. So I think this is the end of the discussion. Correct, right? So I would like to right. close this. I would like to close this forum discussion by thanking all of the speakers and our beloved panel for uh, Miss Kirsten especially for your participation in our forum discussion. And thank you so much and have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Miss Kirsten, for spending your time yeah. with us. Yeah. <laughs>